Hello, and welcome to Shape the System, where we find and tell the stories that help people to rethink the way the world works. We interview people from all over the world who are helping to change our systems for the better. Shape the System is an independent podcast with support from KPMG High Growth Ventures, who help ambitious founders and their teams scale up for success. More about KPMG High Growth Ventures after the interview. We hope you enjoy this episode. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode. Talking to Rob Rastovich today, who's up in the far Pacific Northwest. Tell us where you are, Rob. We'll get started there and then we'll dive into the problem. <laughs> I'm actually in a little town called Bend, Oregon, right in the middle of the state of Oregon, up in the Pacific oh, Northwest. Lovely. And I place that in, I mean, for people who maybe aren't familiar where Oregon is or, you know, of this part of the world, maybe just, just paint a picture for us. What is this part of the world like? So Oregon, the Pacific Northwest is, you know, considered Oregon and Washington. So we're right on the West Coast, right. sitting right above California. Yeah. Our climate and the area that we live in is a, kind of a high desert area. So okay. it's sunny and warm most of the time and really cold in the winter. So uh. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, probably getting drier and warmer in the summer, I'm guessing, over the last few years, potentially. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, it has. Very good. Well, as usual, we're going to dive straight into the problem. We, we will jump into a little bit of a dive into the thermic product a bit later on. I'm super interested in this. But what I want to understand is what is the context the thermic product operates in? So, I mean, food wastage is kind of a really broad umbrella, and we actually talk a lot about food wastage here on the show. But I want to get specific as to the area of food and the overall value chain that, you know, that thermic is, is, is tackling. Just maybe just dance us into that, especially in the, the North American context would be fine, you know, in terms of data. Sure. Yeah. So it was actually born out of, so in addition to being, you know, CTO of ThingLogix, I'm also a cattle rancher here in right. Central Oregon. So I'm a third generation rancher and I actually live on the ranch that my grandfather actually homesteaded uh, 102 years ago. Awesome. And so the, the Thermix was actually kind of born out of that idea. And we process beef here and we sell beef to restaurants and commercials, commercial customers, you know, around the Pacific Northwest and on the West Coast. And being able to make sure that your your product is safe and that it's been, it never goes outside of a, a given temperature became right. kind of an important deal to us. Right. Keeping if your freezer starts to go down, it's it's a big deal. So that's kind of where we started with this. And then it, mm-hmm. it started to evolve more. And it was really, it was really around, hey, uh, we have an IoT platform. I have a freezer and I want to monitor it. We should be able to make something that does that. We, we did a proof of concept around that. But then it really started to mm-hmm. go into a larger context. So not only keeping things cold, but not letting things get too warm, but also not letting things get too cold. So greenhouses being able to monitor humidity and temperatures in, in the greenhouses. In Oregon, I don't know if you're aware of this, but we have a large cannabis crop that yeah. um, <laughs> actually is grown here. And yep. monitoring... Legally. Mon- <laughs> illegally, yeah. Illegally, yeah. <laughs> so monitoring those crops is is a big deal. If it gets too cold in there and whatnot, it becomes a very expensive proposition if the temperature gets out of whack. So Thermix was really developed around that idea of, of being able to get early detection of if an area is getting too hot or too cold. Yeah, that's super interesting. I, mean, I hadn't sort of thought about it in that kind of parallel context. We had a chat a while ago with Olympia Yaga from Goterra. They, they produce a essentially a shipping container and you put food in one side and then there's maggot larvae in the other side and they, for three weeks, eat all the food and then turn it into byproducts that they can then use to feed non-ruminants. And the thing that she talked about, yeah, super super cool tech and basically they stick them in like a a hotel, like in the, in the, you know, the, the, the ground floor of the basement of a hotel and all the food waste from the hotel goes in. It's an epic product. But the thing she spoke about that was super interesting, she said that humans are actually very resilient to a wide range of temperatures, right? She said most of the animals that you deal with, most of the microbes, most of these smaller life forms are actually very sensitive to changes in temperature and changes in mm-hmm. conditions. And is that kind of a parallel here? Is that if you're trying to grow something or ship something or store something, there's actually a very narrow window and temperature is one of the things here. Is, is that kind of the, the, the crux of the challenge here? No, absolutely. As a farmer, temperature is like everything, right? Right. So right now we're in the middle of a drought and a heat wave. Right. And so you really have to start thinking of differently about not only how you manage your products and whatnot, but how what kind of crops you grow. Mm-hmm. And we've had a drought for three years, so now we have to start changing 
kind of the food that we grow and how we manage not only that, but our, our livestock yeah. and how we manage that. So, and the same thing is true around the food after it processing, right. whether it's beef, lamb, chicken, carrots, corn, or whatever, that process of, of monitoring and managing that, especially around restaurants mm. too, you know, restaurants being able to, you know, manage their waste and whatnot becomes a, a real big deal for them. Yeah. So and that's kind of what our niche is. And, and <laughs> I love the usage of the words niche, niche in some of these things because they're huge challenges. And I think people tend to think yeah. niche is like this tiny little <laughs> narrow thing. But, but I, let's, I want to paint some of the, the picture here of some of the pieces along the way of this value chain, right? So, yeah, there's, there's, the food is grown or the, you know, the animal is, you know, grown. I guess is probably the right word for it. Then there's kind of the area where you turn, you know, that raw product for want of a better word, an animal in this case, but potentially a non-animal product as well. Mm-hmm. There's some kind of, I guess, work that's done to, to turn that into a, a shippable product. What like, then there's actually putting it on a, truck or something and, and shipping it somewhere what are the other steps along the way all the way through to the restaurant and all the way to the table like what are the stages in that so there's there's actually two paths to that right so right. there's and and we actually monitor both there's a call of a, a, a fresh product so we actually will we have commercial customers restaurants that want fresh ground beef every week right we are actually processing animals every week and it quite literally goes from the processing plant it gets ground up it gets refrigerated immediately mm-hmm. but then it's only going to stay it's going to keep a temperature of between you know 30 32 and 43 degrees <laughs> at any That's given uh, time fahrenheit by the way for our, our metric yes, viewers. sorry <laughs> <laughs> so it's about zero to seven yeah, that, yeah. something like that <laughs> yes okay yeah 32 would be quite hot i guess quite in your warm world, for, yeah <laughs> <laughs> any kind of fruit or vegetable or yeah. animal product <laughs> sorry yeah didn't. so but I mean, managing that, you know, that sure. variance in there from so, and then it gets shipped fresh and, and then they consume it. It's, it's quite literally, it's it just goes close from to the farm parts. to the top. Yeah, to the fork. And, yeah, yeah right. it's, it's okay. two steps. It goes from the farm to the processor and then yep. the processor to the restaurant. Yeah. So, and then the second path is a little more for our, you know, more consumer base where we're doing, you know, whole cows or those kinds of things that have to go to consumers where they have a freezer and they want to store it for, you know, for to have meat for the whole year, that will be going and get frozen. So that goes from the processor into a freezer. There's a monitor at the processor's freezer, goes into a freezer truck. There's a monitor in the freezer truck. Mm -hmm. The truck comes to uh, our farm, all goes into our freezer, and then that goes to the actual consumer back through the same truck. So at any given time, whether it be at the processor in transit yep. or resident here, we, we keep a monitor on what the temperature is of that particular Got it. And those two channels sort of represent how you get from farm to plate, you know, a fork, did you say yep. farm to fork? Yeah. It's got a much better ring yep. to it. Like I'm thinking beyond the, those channels that are specific to yourselves and to your ranch, What's the, the channel that, or the value chain, I guess, between kind of this larger scale of farm that's going out through some distributor or retailer? And because I'm, I'm guessing there's like hubs. I we've spoke to Eddie Badrina from Making Greens a couple of weeks ago, and he talked about these distribution centers that are next to the big retail outlets. Yep. Like, what does that value chain look like as well? Because I'm assuming Thermic might play in this context as well, right? It does indeed. So if you look at a larger operation than ours that in the set of local, yep. that's actually going it you know, it starts and there's a lot of fresh product in there. So right. one of our partner ranches, they actually supply a lot of product to Whole Foods. And right. that looks right. it's a very similar thing. So there's it's a fresh process. So there's a mm-hmm. fresh process that goes quite literally from the ranch to the processor, mm-hmm. into the processor, then it goes to a more of a, like a second processor. So it goes to a kill plant where yep. the animal is, is killed. And then it goes to a more, a larger, you know, meat packing plant, right. you know, where they're going to, they're going to just grind, you know, tens and thousands of pounds of, yeah. of ground beef. Mm-hmm. And then from there, it'll go to a distributor, you know, like a Cisco or a, a, a big, you know, distribution network. And then it goes into the grocery stores. Right. So you got a couple extra hops in there, yep. right? So you've got, you got an extra processor in there and you probably have an extra distributor in there and anywhere along the lines, as long as those are being monitored, you can monitor. And we can even get down to the point where the label on the package, mm. you know, so once it gets labeled, right. that has a sensor and so it can, it can monitor itself all the way through. And that's kind of my, my sort of follow on question from this. I think when it's you and the customer being either the restaurant or the retailer, 
it's important that there's measurement on both sides and you kind of know what happened. But when you start to have four or five parties in the value chain, like if you're party number three, what happened at step one and step two is critically important to understanding yeah. how long you've got, right, or, or what you need to do or yeah. what your optionality is here. Is The point here isn't just that these are devices that measure the current context, which is, hey, you're currently in a truck and everything looks fine, but they have some connectivity to the steps before and the steps after. Is that right? Like how this really plays out? Exactly. Like So if without that, mm. right? So if you're the distributor and two steps before right. you, somebody, you know, that temperature got too high and, you know, maybe it was there for not very long, but you now have, and you can see if it was spoiled for a long period of time, but it's that little area in between where maybe it wasn't mm. at its, you know, its ideal temperature. And that was two steps before you. So you are really disconnected from, right. you know, steps one and two, but you're responsible right. for having and impacted, a, a quality that. product. Right. Yeah, and financially impacted. Mm. So having the ability to, even for each step along the way, for have some kind of reliability that knows that, hey, the product that I got, I got it from point A, from point B, but I can see what happened at point A. You know, and kind of think about it like in terms of if you're buying a car, right? right? If you bought a, a used car, right. and maybe you're buying a used car from somebody, but who bought it new from somebody else? Who bought it from somebody else? And it's yeah. two or three downs rows. And then you know there was these different companies that came out about you know I think Carfax in the U.S. Yeah, is the just one car that or the it tries to keep track of every accident and every service that it does, so that you're not just relying on the guy before yeah, you. Yeah, you're yeah. kind of going, okay, <laughs> I want to see the history of this this whole thing. You know? Yeah, that's, that's super fascinating. Just as an aside, I, I'm partial to old cars. I have a '71 Charger, and like the thing, the thing you do when you buy an old car is you want to know, hey, how many people were there between yeah. me and the original yeah. person who bought it? And if you get to, like yeah. two owners over the last 50 years, you're like, all right, like the, the risk yeah. tolerance there is mu- is like, okay, how much could have possibly gone wrong as opposed to seven sets? Yeah, hands? exactly. So, just, I mean, this presents yeah, exactly. like a massive opportunity, but I mean, a huge kind of challenge. I mean, because ultimately you're no longer saying, hey, would you like my sensor? What you're actually saying is, hey, I'm, the two people before you already have the sensor. Or I, as the manufacturer, have it and the packing plant has it. If you use our sensors, then you're going to inherit not just our sensor, but also all the data that came before it. Is that part of the way this goes to market? Or? Yeah. Well, yeah. So the go to market strategy, there's a lot of different avenues. Mm. You know, cold, you know, food processing is one of them. One of our customers is a, is an ice cream manufacturer. Mm. From there, it's it's you know um, it's pretty easy to tell whether ice cream say, has been above also, temperature if you get or not. Meat right? to ice cream. That's, that, I mean, it's obviously <laughs> food that needs to be kept at a temperature. I get that. But please go on. Sorry <laughs> well, well, it's you know from there, like you don't really need. I mean, if you look at it and it's melted, it's yeah. melted, right? So there's no there's no two times before you. It doesn't really matter. Doesn't matter right? There, it matters. It matters. You know that 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 product is is being you know kept frozen right and because uh, in our particular ranch what we do is we actually work with local breweries right Mm. so we actually pick up the beer mash from the local breweries and feed that the cows right and so you know when you have a burger you come to town and have a burger and a beer you're eating a burger raised on the beer you're drinking but those beer breweries also want to keep beer right. at a very specific temperature through the whole whole process. Right. So Burn. go to market is very different mm. depending on what industry you go to. It's you know you can go to frozen food, food chain, cold chain along the produce and and meat uh, industries is very important. But even the you know the the beer industry and wine industry obviously yeah, yeah. and the liquor industry being able to manage humidities and and mm. temperatures in those large, you know, yeah, distilleries is a go to market. The, the thing that I think yeah. that's interesting, though, and and new and, and possible now that wasn't possible before with a whole set of connected devices that are, relatively speaking, far more cheaply available and easier to network and have talk to each other, is like, you know, the idea that there might ultimately, or that there are, not ultimately, but you will start to see the emergence of network effects and the, the, the definition of a network is when you add someone to the network, they get value and the network gets more value. And that mm. set of conditions, I, you never sort of imagine that, you know, have you gone on, you've walked up to a fridge before and seen that thing that tells you what the temperature is in the fridge. And the idea that that fridge is now somehow contributing to a larger network of data, I think is a fascinating mm. leap from where we are. Is the conditions that have kind of created that now, you know, just these macros of everything's connected, the data's there, like what? 
Like what changed that meant that this is now kind of possible and, and where does Thermic kind of sit in that and, and the company generally? So I'm going to try and keep it succinct, Twist, because you've hit upon like my passion right there, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, because, uh, you know, as uh, we at, at Thing Logics, we're, we, we're, we're an, an internet of things company. Right. And I always call it the internet of everything. Right. right. And so imagine a world not. And so what we're, what you and I have been talking about is, okay, we go out and we, we'll, we'll pick the plant. We'll, we'll cut down the head of cabbage. Right. We'll put the head of cabbage in a box. It'll go into the refrigerator and we'll watch it from there. Hmm. Well, why not go take a step back a little bit further than that? Let's monitor the soil that the cabbage is in. Hmm. Let's, for, let's, provide the nutrients and we do this we actually have soil sensors that go into the soils and then the irrigation we call it a fertigation system it provides not only moisture Mm -hmm. but nutrients to that plant right so now you not only get to see you know kind of what temperature it was which is you know kind of interesting information but imagine knowing the nutrients that went into this particular plant the seed the genetics it was and where did that seed come from Mm. and that being able to see and now how much cabbage is available to be picked and managing inventories based on what's actually in the farm and when it's going to be ready and how it's, you know, maturing and when it's getting too mature. Cause you know, plants, cows and everything, there's actually a sweet spot in there for when you want to process them. Mm. Right. So you don't want to let a, uh, an ear of corn go too long right. because it'll start to go to feed. Right. You want to pick it at exactly the right time. You don't want a, a steer to get too big or to get, too old because the meat's not as good. So that chain, not just from when you process it on, but the whole thing, interconnectivity of our, and take it one step further. Imagine now, okay, you now have a farm with the soil sensor in it and the fertigation that's sending the water. Where does the water come from? Well, the water comes from a river that's potentially thousands of miles away. So what, how much water is in the river or in the mountains? How much snowpack Mm. is in the mountains on the mountains that are maybe a continent away from you right. and how fast is it melting and how fast is it coming down the river to know how much water I'm going to get so I can know how much I can plant so you can know how much you're going to eat. You know, the whole, the whole thing connected connected. thing. <laughs> it is. And, and we all, all so often we always just think, Oh, well, you know, I, I, I go to the supermarket, I pick out my ground beef and there it is. Yeah, yeah. But that ground beef is so much dependent upon how much snow fell in the Rocky Mountains uh, last two years year, ago. yeah, yeah, and exactly, and how mm. much is in the other, and monitor, and we do all that, right? And Thing Logics, we actually work with the United States Geological Service, and we're actually monitoring mm. Colorado River and other rivers, major tributaries of water, to see how that flow is coming and how that flow, hundreds or thousands of miles away from you, or is going to be able to take effect, mm. and you can make decisions as a farmer or a rancher in uh, way down the stream. So it's and we always talk about how the earth is connected and everything is connected, but we actually quite literally now can connect and measure every portion. Of yeah. That. That's just, and that's to me is the, is the exciting Yeah, part, Yeah. Right? I mean, like I didn't say it before we jumped on the show, but I tend to sort of look for what I call the matrix moment, which is like, Oh, oh okay. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think we hit the matrix moment. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, you did. Hey, I'm, yes, I'm you obviously did. got a bunch of follow on questions. So the, the first thing I'm kind of curious about is, once you get this avalanche of instrumentation and data, how is it that you as an individual or as a rancher or as a, someone who drives a truck, that, like how, how do you work with that data? How do you synthesize it? Yeah. And then also what are the two or three big things that you say, if we knew all this stuff, the, the big things that we would ultimately impact, the amount of food that doesn't go to waste or the quality or nutrition of that food, what are the kind of the big outcomes that start to happen when you start to be able to get this data and work with this data. So uh, yeah, yeah, that's you know you're going to take me way down into the good to the rabbit hole with this one. Oh, good. But <laughs> so you're you're exactly right. You get this. How do you get this large amount of data? And that was one of the things that Thing Logic. Um, Thing Logic was actually born out of a company hmm. called Telemetry, right. and my partners and I we built a technology that would ingest billions and billions and billions and billions of data simultaneously. Uh, right. We ended up selling that company to Amazon, and that is today what is Amazon refers to as the microservice AWS IoT. So Thing Logic hmm. was now born out of the idea, okay, we just sold this technology to Amazon. So now we, the question was exactly that. Now you can ingest all this data, but how do you process it? In the name right. of the company, how do you put logic, how do you hmm. put the logic against the things? And so we developed right. a way so that you could put 
intelligence and AI around all this and make intelligence decisions and move, be able to make something so that when the water sensor goes off in the basement because the hot water heater is leaking, it's smart enough to turn the valve off and stop the water from coming in. Right. You know, and if the valve goes off and knows that, it's smart enough to implement a trouble ticket to the plumber and call him out to go in. Mm. So all these things kind of, but being able to put that intelligence was the trick. And being able to process what's important. Most of the data that it, that if you were to see all this data, it would be like, it's just too overwhelming. You don't yeah, know what yeah. to do with it. It literally looks like so, the matrix, I'm guessing. <laughs> it does. It does. It, and at some point when you, what we do, what we've been able to do is be able to put the intelligence kind of in line for all this data mm. and then feed to you that stuff that's important. Right. Like you don't really care if the temperatures of your freezer is still at zero. Or yeah, zero. Yeah, zero. You got zero. <laughs> 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 I guess zero is zero in both worlds, right? <laughs> yeah, minus thirty-two is zero. Um, They're the equation. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, if if as long as it's zero, you don't care. You mm-hmm. only care when there's it starts to go, up, and you don't want to be watching it all the time. So that's what the logic is and mm-hmm. how to put that in there. And then once you start to have that, being able to correlate that and, and be able to communicate between other devices, having a standard so that a machine can talk to machine Mm. and that, you know, I can tell you to do something and being able to coordinate that. We're still in the infancy stages, in in my opinion, of being able to do that. We're just now getting to the point where people are going, wait a minute, I think I understand. Mm. If I... I could talk to this and this could talk to that. We could we could actually get a little more efficiencies. Out. And, and it's just kind of the and like while while we're here in the detail of this, this is kind of the interplay between the underlying kind of tech stack, if we want to call it that, and the productization of of an, a single way or an, a narrow way niche to use your word before way to bring that to life in the, the thermic product. So in theory, someone who said, "Oh, I've got an idea for a thermic type thing," but in a totally different context could take the underlying yeah. thing, thing logic's tech capability and say, I'm going to productize this to solve my, you know, internet of things, monitoring, exactly. networking challenge. Have I got that right? Exactly. And so, and one of our challenge was, this is a very difficult concept. Sometimes mm-hmm. people, you start to talk about the internet of things and people kind of glass over. Every now and then the, the light bulb goes off, like you say, and you get the matrix moment, you go, oh my God, I get it. Mm. Thermix is really kind of our way of going, wait a minute, all right, let's make this simple. What if I could monitor mm. the temperature of your freezer? Would that be value? Of course. If, uh, I, and could you send me a text message when the temp? Yep, I could send you a text message when the temperature got too high. That would be great. Hey, could you also monitor my refrigerator? Yeah, we can monitor. Your- hey, could you monitor the power that's coming in so that if the power got cut, yeah, we can mount it to power. And and then the what ifs keep going and right. they keep going. And then pretty soon you start to build it out and you start realizing, wait, hey, what if I could connect the Colorado River yeah. to the cabbage head that's <laughs> in the thing? And once you start making that connection and all the things that it, then the matrix moment really happens. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, mean, I feel like also part of this is thermic is a way, and I want to get back to some of the more specifics of thermic in a minute, but thermic is also a way of illustrating what's possible with the capability and the technology yeah. and where we're at now anyway to potentially inspire the next 10 thermics in other 10 contexts, even if you don't build them. Is that kind of part of exactly. the duality this? Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. And so, yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's super exciting. <laughs> I love that. You're just uh, coming back to thermic a little bit, and, and this kind of comes down to where it plays. I mean, there definitely is a, you know, like I think about energy in Australia now, right? Most of the homes in Australia have a normal meter. Someone walks in, waves to you through the window like I do have here and says, I just need to check, you know, mouth, I just need to check your meter. And they come and look at a thing and write a number down and tell the energy company and then you get a bill like a month later. Obviously, progressively now, more and more households have a smart meter. It checks every 30 minutes. It sends data back. Is that a bit of what is happening in the thermic space where there is sensors there, you can see a temperature, doesn't talk to anything, doesn't network, doesn't store data, doesn't, is that really the hardware gap that we're living in at the moment? Yeah, it's, well, and so those, you know, the smart meters have been around for a while, right. but they've been hardwired kind of, and it was easy for them in smart meters to say, okay, well, we're good, we have a meter on your house. Mm. 
and we have a wire that runs from your house to our, yeah, uh, right. <laughs> our, our there's actually a wire that we can send data over so it wasn't a big leap for them to go okay well we'll just take and we'll move the meter out we'll put one on there and instead of us having to come out there right. and read the meter we'll just send the data back through the wire right. and we'll provision off and oh, we've got it so that made a lot of sense it gets a little more difficult now when you've got a freezer with huge, thick walls designed to keep a signal, right. designed to keep air yeah, out. Right, right. And how do you get data out of that to a place that then can move it up to someplace else? Yeah. So what has happened now is not so much like the IoT has been evolving, but it's be, the technology has gotten to the point now where, A, the price has come down. Mm-hmm. So like a thermic solution is couple hundred bucks you're up and running and you're monitoring your stuff on a second by second basis but the technology the laura technology that we use to communicate to that wasn't around you know 10 or 15 years ago what what was that technology called laura did you say laura and so laura it's more of like wi-fi is a technology to communicate Mm -hmm. data back and forth uh radio frequencies rf is a technology so laura is a is another technology like that but what Mm -hmm. it does is it has a very small payload, like you're not going to stream video on it or right. anything, but it goes for miles. Like it can go, uh, like line of sight, I want to say it's 50 miles or yeah, something, right. maybe even 100 miles. So you can you can now start connecting things that were unconnectable right. before, right. and the signal's very strong, and you can you know do it. So technologies like that are starting to really evolve. Now there's applications that you know are popping up. One of my favorite stories about how this changes, you know, the world of business and how businesses are changing. Mm-hmm. I had a guy come to me one time and he was, he was a pool cleaner. He had a, you know, he'd go <laughs> clean pool. He'd go, he'd go around, he goes, he goes, I want to build my website and I want to make a bigger, better website. And I want my customers to be able to order my products online. I want them to be able to schedule maintenance and, and I want to be able to do all these communicate. I said, you're in the wrong, that's the wrong business. You don't need a better website. <laughs> what you need is a connected pool pump. Right. And we actually ended up building the connected pool pump. So now you don't you don't require your customer to ask you for the products. Yeah. You don't require them to do that. The pool pump, you know, will send the data back when the saline yeah, or when the need saline. Yep. It, yeah, it sends it it sends the chlorine right out to you. It sends it to you when you need it. Yeah. It does predictive maintenance. So you don't get a call on Friday night going, I got a pool party tomorrow and yeah. the pool pump is busted. Right. The pool pump calls you and says, it looks like I'm going to break in about two weeks right. Right. and you can preventatively schedule it. It's a very different business model. You mm. start using subscription-based models and stuff like that. So it really changes how we do business. Yeah. So, you said that was someone who you'd work with. Was that the company basically saying, we've got this capability here and you partnered with them to bring that? product to market like how did that play i just want to go down that for a second yeah so we actually so we focus on the software and the cloud aspect of it the hardware we partner with a hardware several different hardware companies that just enable or basically enable a a device whether that be a refrigerator a home a thermostat a pool pump whatever you have you you know it's adding those modules to that device so it can connect back up to the cloud yeah yeah i found that super interesting because i think Temperature is kind of shorthand for, hey, something's changed. But you sort of mentioned, you mm-hmm. know, it's moisture in the soil and the amount of sun and electricity. Like, what is the, give me the depth of, or the breadth of what's being instrumented or could be instrumented in these different types of use cases as well. I'm curious about other things other than temperature. Yeah. So we're monitoring everything. So with the US, US, we're actually, we're, like I said, we mentioned, we're monitoring rivers and we're doing that. We're doing that not with sensors in the water. We're actually doing it with video cameras. Right. So that it watches the river and then the which algorithms that determine whether, what the flow of the water is. We do it recognition. So doing like, we have a large construction companies where you do facial recognition and it clocks them in and out. So instead of clocking in and out, it does that. Yeah. We monitor volcanoes, we monitor the Grand Canyon. <laughs> we have snow geese that have the uh, sensors yeah. on them. We monitor the, the flight patterns of snow geese. We monitor ducks. We have little ducks <laughs> that have backpacks and they send data back. <laughs> <laughs> we monitor huge, we have smart cities. So there's a cable company that uses our technology. So they have street lights that are enabled. Mm. You know, the they're playing around with the idea of being able to have a smart street light so that when there's emergency vehicles, the street lights start flashing right. or they turn red or they change color or if snow conditions, monitoring, you know, the the roads, 
you know, and I mean, you name it, it's, we're trying to connect. It. Yeah. And, and I guess my follow on question from that sort of relates to how do you use all the data relates to how do you design a product when everything's out there? Like, is it like, what I can I mean, you end you have at the moment, you have a physical product permit and it pr- mm-hmm. plays a role and it plays a role in a larger context. What is the actual process through which you've arrived at? designing and, and building and creating that product where you sort of there was it a sketch on a paper or someone said if only we could do x or do you like just help, talk me through the kind of the creative process i guess and the, uh, the go-to-market process of the actual productization itself yeah and that's really kind of the fun process because there's still enough people if it, the, the first key for us is finding a cto or a cio mm. of a company that is forward thinking enough to think we can do a better job. Right. We can make a, a better mousetrap, if you will. And, and that's kind of the key for us. Then it's the brainstorming sessions. We had a, a customer, they were a cleaning company. They sold cleaning products. Mm. They came up and they want to do the internet of clean for on a commercial basis. So being able to, in a restaurant, to monitor the dishwashers and the ovens and everything in there so that they could sell product in there and start. So they were connecting a restaurant and everything in the restaurant mm. for the sole purposes of being able to sell them cleaning products and those kinds of things. So once they got connected, you know, they're really sticky. They're not going to go anywhere else. Mm. Hoover Vacuum Cleaners was another customer of ours. And doing the connected vacuum, you know, we actually experimented with the idea of doing vacuums as a service, right? Yeah. So every, everybody, the number one reason why people return their vacuum cleaner is because the filter got full and it doesn't work. And they think, them fil- they think the vacuum cleaner's broke. So we did, we did an experiment with where we put, we connect, made it a connected vacuum cleaner and it sent you a new filter yeah, and said, yeah. here, take the old one out, put the old one in. Yeah. Then they took it to the next level of going, wait a minute, let's not just tell them when to put the filter in. What if we gave them and we gave them the vacuum cleaner and charged them instead of, you know, 500 bucks for the vacuum cleaner, it's $25 a month. Yeah. And you just pay $25 a month. And every two years, we send you a brand new vacuum cleaner. Yeah, yeah. It changes how you do that. But you've got, we have, you know, our challenge is getting for 10 years ago when we first started this, mm. we were with the engineer in the basement of, of corporate America soldering boards together. Yeah. And now we've, we've moved up to kind of to the C-suite where yeah, at least the CTO will look at us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a, but I, now we're, yeah. Sorry, good. Uh, the, the now we're you know now we're trying to convince the CEOs that say, look, there is a new way to do business, and mm. it's a it's a it's a sticky way. It's a you you got to think differently, and send. It's not just sending people to your website anymore. And you know, Amazon is doing this too. If they're you've seen their Go stores, the Amazon Go store is. If you haven't heard about it, it's it's a store that has no. It's cashless. Yeah. There's no checkout stands. There's nothing. You walk in, you pick up what you want. And you walk out and the whole mm. store is connected and it automatically charges your credit card as you walk out the door. Mm. And there's a series of technologies that they use to do that. And so it's changing the way people do business. But that's a big push. Yeah. That's a big change. Yeah. And I think I think the thing that is kind of you don't know what you don't know, right? And I think if you if you're not aware of how these technologies are being utilized already and even in a different context, then the thought bubble that has to happen inside a CTO or a product or a founder or whatever's head yeah. to say, how might we apply those technologies into our context or that way of thinking, not even those technologies, but that idea of instead of saying to someone, hey, buy our cleaning products, what we'll do is we'll build a, a tool that monitors when the cleaning products are required and we'll simply supply them to you when they're required. And it'll actually cost you less money in cleaning because you're not buying yeah. stuff you don't need and the mechanism through which you acquire it requires less effort, so less money and less effort, that's usually two ticks. And as a result, you'll have a lower impact on the environment because you're not utilizing products that you don't need on a basis. And you turn the dial and say, how lo- you know, how OCD are you? How clean do you want your house? Yeah. So I just think there's something, there's something super interesting about this parallel. I kind of come back to this idea that the thermic product that sort of says to someone who owns a fridge that has meat in it, hey, here's how this device can work differently from just the temperature gauge. It actually unlocks a way of managing the outcome, which is I want to sell a highly nutritious product that hasn't gone off, that doesn't leave a liability and a reputational risk, and I need to not only know what it looks like in my fridge but four stores away in terms of, you know, four steps away, sorry. And that serves as a beacon for what else could you do if you took that same model and approach. Just in terms of the company itself, it sounds to me like you you kind of 
waiting for these inbound? Are you actively taking this out and thinking we've got some hypotheses in areas and we're going to go and approach some innovative companies and say, hey, we think we might be able to help you? How does that interaction play out? Yeah, so we actually do both. We've actually been around doing it long enough now. We've got a good, good enough traction, so we got we got plenty of inbound. But what we have decided to do is, I mean, is to demonstrate how this is, is we started spinning up more and more of these little companies. Mm-hmm. Thermix is one of them. We did a company called WorkWatch, which was another a subsidiary of ThingLogix. When COVID was there, it was a it was an application that you know took your a kiosk. You went, you yep. know, stood up, and you've seen them. You stood in front of it. Yep. Takes your temperature, scans yep. your face, mm. does compliance. You know, it, and it it makes sure that you're in compliance. People counting. Right. That was another big one during the COVID thing. How many people are in the store? It automatically counts the number of people going in and out stops people when they can't come in right. a simple thing like counting the number of people going in but you can put a little device up there during the pandemic they had people outside counting you know yeah. hitting the clicker <laughs> and they're paying two or three full-time people just to count a clicker when you put a little employment. device up there and it, okay. yeah yeah uh, and compliance was really kind of a byproduct that we stumbled onto mm. we had a, one of our very first devices was a connected soap dispenser you know and you mm. go in you put your hand under it and soap comes out well we thought well that would be kind of cool because now you would know when the soap dispenser runs out of soap right we thought that was what the the use case was turns out no one really cares because they're going to put the soap in it anyway right and knowing when a soap runs out wasn't as important as knowing how many times a day people were using the soap Right. So we put it in delis in a, there was a in company in, in Europe that we, well, we we'll put it in their, in their deli so mm. they could keep track of how many times the employees are washing their hands. Mm. And so that became a compliance issue of if you have a store who employees are not washing their hands enough, mm. that's a problem. Mm. So it wasn't really it, the connectivity was and the data wasn't about how much soap it was. It was how many times are you using it? So that we know that you are using the, you are washing your hands and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Fascinating. I mean, obviously, I mean, it's a limitless amount of opportunities to apply the thinking and the technology to it. Just kind of coming back to your kind of arc of the story, I'm trying to connect the dots between ranching, third generation ranching, 102 (laughs) years, I think you said, and CTO of a company that sold to Amazon that then enabled you to build this out and how you balance those things today. Can you just give me the arc of this story and, how those things sit alongside each yeah, other. There. Yeah. They actually work complementary to one another, believe it or not. You know, and I get that a lot. Like, how can you do one and the other? I actually, you know, I was born and raised on, on the ranch I live in. Mm-hmm. And I went, I went off and got a degree in, in marketing. Was actually had an advertising agency in Southern California for a while and was working on, you know, marketing. And then the internet came along. And it was just the internet was, oh, hey, a web page. It looks like a brochure. It's kind of like a brochure. We should go sell this to our customers. Well, uh, I got the bug and started, you know, coding. And then I built e commerce sites and I started building web applications. Then, you know, the cloud came around. You know, I started doing salesforce.com consulting and those kinds of things and always was pushing it, always pushing it. And then a couple of guys, I, when we first saw the, the protocol is called MQTT is the yeah. protocol that we send data back for. Then I saw that for the first time. I thought this was the coolest <laughs> thing ever. And so we started, you know, playing around and tinkering with stuff and trying to build stuff. And I always say that that mentality it really is a, is a rancher's mentality. Right. Because, you know, grow, growing up on a ranch, you, you never really, you never go and say, where can I go buy the thing that I need? Right. You got to make it. You got to, you, you, right. you go right. to any ranch, whether it's in here or in Australia or New Zealand, there is the most innovation happens on ranches and they build these stuff. What they say, necessity is the mother of invention. And it's true. Yeah, mother of invention. Yes. yes I've so. always had that mentality of how could I make it work? How can I make something better? How can I do mm. something? And that, once I got the technology bug and I learned to program and did all that, I just couldn't get enough of it. And so my professional career took off on the technology side, but I always came back to the ranch. Yeah. And the way they live in, in concert is, and, and I think I'm always one of the luckiest guys because my best ideas come after I, I put down the, I set, set the laptop down, get away from it. And I'll go out and, you know, whether I'm feeding cows or, you know, load them up or hauling them in or changing yeah. irrigation, yeah. it's that time for you to kind of decompress. And, mm. you know, that's kind of when it all kind of comes together. But if I had to do ranching full time, I'd probably go crazy. And if I had to do <laughs> technology full time, I'd probably go crazy. But the two keep me, you know, they kind of keep me sane. So oh, that's, uh, I, I honestly didn't expect that to be the arc of that. I think 
just a couple of thoughts and a couple of comments, I guess. I don't know anyone who went from ranching into marketing and then somehow got into programming. So for anyone who's yeah. listening who's <laughs> in marketing who thinks they can't learn to code, I would challenge that yeah, notion absolutely. straight away. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I think, absolutely. I think what you're describing as well, which is which is wonderful, is is a concept of work life harmony. Do you know? And I think the mm. ranch view feels like life rather than work. Mm. You know, it feels like mm-hmm. where you know where you're, you're happy place, but obviously you have to kind of contrast that with you know, like you know how to ranch, right? You know, you know what's yeah, there, and you yeah. grew up with that, and that's kind of in, in you. And the work part is the part that kind of complements that, being all the discovery and the challenge, and how does this thing work? And I'm sure there's still challenges on the ranch as well. The other thing that's interesting about this is it sounds to me like you're you personally, or maybe the company generally. Is very distributed and set up remotely. With that, is that correct as well? You're obviously doing a bunch of your actual yeah. work from the farm or from the ranch. Absolutely, yeah. I'm here most of the time now. Our headquarters is in San Francisco, yeah. so most of the guys are down there. But we, so we also have a large Dubai presence. Mm. The Middle East, in terms of IoT, has is far outpacing. I mean, their acceptance and of and their willingness to try these connected products just their appetite for it just far exceeds that in the u.s and so we have a a very large presence there we also have developers in india and in egypt so we yeah we are pretty distributed our headquarters are like i say i'm down in san francisco so i'm down there periodically and i always kind of have a when i'm down in san francisco and you talk about ranching people look at me like Wait, wait a minute. You mean you, you go to the store? No, no. no. I, I put the stuff in the store. Ah. And you know, then the thing that happens before I, the fork? That's me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and when I'm here and I'm talking to my rancher buddies and I talk about IoT, they, what is it? You know, no, no, no never mind. <laughs> so, oh, that's wonderful. So I kind of I kind of keep one foot in both worlds. I think that is wonderful. And probably just the last question for me, like, like where to, not where to from here, but kind of what's like the thing right in front of you guys right now on, on the either thermic side or on the thing logic side generally? Right in front of us is our, I, I really feel is our breakout moment. We've, and for years we have had, I always described it, we have solved a problem that most people don't know they have. And it's, they're kind of mm-hmm. finally starting to catch up to the point where, wait a minute, you know, and, uh, and I love your phrase that when they have their matrix moments, when they realize, wait, all this stuff is connected. And we, how do we do that? Then they go and we say, oh, let me show you. Oh my right. God. Then that's when it, it starts to happen. And that's starting to happen to the point we're looking at some partnerships with other larger companies to help uh, accelerate that and whatnot. So I really think, and I feel that, you know, ThingLogix is kind of at our breakout moment. We've been doing this for almost 10 years now. I, you know, just like in farming, I always say a smarter person would not be a farmer. A smarter person <laughs> probably wouldn't be running a startup for 10 years. But <laughs> the good news is you don't have to work a day in your life if you love what you're doing, right? So <laughs> Absolutely. I think I was going to, I think echoing what you're saying is um, that often people say you're in the right place at the right time. And sometimes you just need to be in the right place and wait until the right time. And yeah, that exactly. feels a little bit about what's exactly. going on here as well for you guys. <laughs> amazing. Exactly. Amazing. Yeah, exactly. Rob, really awesome chatting you today it's really exciting and fun to go down all those rabbit holes and meanderings that's kind of what we love doing here and yeah we're really really pumped for what you're doing and, and, and can't wait to see what's next for you guys no thanks so much i really appreciate you having it. it's fun talking to you vincent we hope you enjoyed this episode of shape the system as usual if you'd like to suggest a guest someone that you know who's helped to change the system for the better please go to www.shapethesystem.org, click on the top right-hand corner, then click Suggest Guest. Make sure that you click Subscribe so that you get the new episode. Shape the System is an independent podcast with support from KPMG High Growth Ventures. Connects founders to the services they need along their journey. Whether you are looking to refine your strategy, mature your finance function, prepare for a capital raise, expand abroad, or simply comply with regulatory requirements, they provide you with the support you need to drive your business forward.